Chapter 13 Thou takest not away, O death. Thou strikest, absence perisheth, indifference is no more. The future brightens on our sight, for on the past hath fallen a light that tempts us to adore. While Juanita clung with feverish intensity to the hope of discovering her husband's murderer, Lord Cheriton seemed to be gradually resigning himself to the idea that the crime would go to swell the long list of undiscovered murders which he could recall within his own experience of life, crimes which had kept society expectant and on the alert for a month, and which had stimulated the police to unwanted exertions, finally to fade into oblivion or to be occasionally cited as an example of the mysteriousness of human history. He had offered a large reward— he had brought all his own trained intelligence to bear upon the subject. He had thought and brooded upon it by day and by night, and the result had been nil. A hand had been stretched out of the darkness to slay an unoffending young man, in whose life his daughter's happiness had been bound up. That was the whole history of the murder. A shot heard in the night, a bullet fired out of the darkness with fatal aim. Not one indication, not one suggestive fact had been discovered since the night of the murder. "'It is hopeless,' said Lord Cheriton, talking over the calamity with Mr. Scarsdale, the vicar of Cheriton and Testwick, adjoining parishes. "'The crime and the motive of the crime are like inscrutable. "'If one could imagine a reason for the act, it might be easier to get upon the track of the murderer. "'But there is no reason that I can conceive for such a deed. "'It has been suggested to me that Sir Godfrey might have had a secret enemy, "'that his life might not have been as spotless as we think.' I will answer for it that he was never guilty of a dishonorable action, that he provoked no man's hatred by any unworthy act, interrupted the vicar warmly. He had been curate at Millbrook before he got the Cheriton living, and had lived for two years at the Priory while he prepared Godfrey Carmichael for Eton, so he claimed the right to vouch for the honor of the dead. There never was a whiter soul in mortal clay, said the vicar. I am inclined to estimate his character almost as highly as you, replied Lord Cheriton deliberately, yet the straightest walker may make one false step, and there may have been some unfortunate entanglement at the university or in London. I will never believe it. He may have been tempted, he may have yielded to temptation, but if he erred, be sure he atoned for his error to the uttermost of his power. There are errors, seeming light to the steps that stumble, which cannot be atoned for. There was no such error in his youth, I looked in his face on his wedding day, Lord Cheriton, and it was the face of a man of unblemished life, a man who need fear no ghost out of the dead past. Well, you are right, I believe, and in that case the murder is motiveless, the murder of a madman, a madman so profoundly artful in his lunacy as to escape every eye. By heaven, I wish we had the old way of hunting such a quarry, and that a leash of bloodhounds could have been set loose upon his track within an hour of the murder. They would have hunted him down. Their instinct would have found him skulking and shivering in his lair, and we should have needed no astute detective primed with all the traditions of Scotland Yard. It would have been swift, sudden justice, blood for blood. His dark eyes shone with an angry light as he walked up and down the spacious floor of the library, while the vicar stood in front of the fire, looking gravely into his clerical hat, and without any suggestion to offer. I hope Lady Carmichael is recovering her spirits he said feebly after a pause. She is not any happier than she was when her loss was a week old, but she keeps up in a wonderful way. I believe she is sustained by some wild notion that the murderer will be found, that she will live to see her husband's death avenged. I doubt if at present she has any other interest in life. But let us hope she will be cheered by the society of her husband's people. I hear that the Morningsides and the Grenvilles are to be at the Priory in November. Indeed, I have heard nothing about it. I was at Swanage yesterday afternoon and took tea with Lady Jane. She was full of praises of Lady Carmichael's goodness and her desire that all things at the Priory must be just as they had been in Sir Godfrey's lifetime. His brothers-in-law used to be invited for the shooting in November, and they were to be invited this year, on condition that Lady Jane would help to entertain them, and Lady Jane has consented gladly. So there will be a large family party at the Priory on this side of Christmas, concluded the vicar. I am glad to hear it, said Lord Cheriton. Anything is better for her than solitude. Any occupation, if it be only revising a bill of fare or listening to feminine twaddle, is better for her than idleness. Yes, there will be a houseful, pursued the vicar, 
Mrs. Granville takes her nursery with her wherever she goes. And Mrs. Morningside is delighted to leave hers behind her. Yes, she is one of those mothers who are always telling people what paragons of nurses Providence has provided for their darlings, or how admirably their children are being brought up by a model governess, said the vicar, who was severe upon other people's neglect of duty. By the by, talking of mothers, I believe I saw Mrs. Porter's daughter the other day while I was in town. You believe you saw her? Yes, I am not certain. A face flashed past me in the street one night, and when the face was gone, it came upon me that it was Mercy Porter's eyes that looked at me for an instant in the gaslight. I was in a busy thoroughfare on the Surrey side of Westminster Bridge. I had been to hear Vansittart preach a mission sermon at the church near Walworth, and I was walking back to the West End. It was late on a Saturday night, and the road was full of costermongers' barrows, and the pavement was crowded with working people doing their marketing. I tried to overtake the girl whose face had startled me, but it was no use. She had melted into the crowd. I went back the whole length of the street, hoping I might find her in front of one of the coster's stalls, but she must have turned into one of the numerous side streets, and it was hopeless to hunt for her there. Yet I should have been very glad to get hold of her. Is she much changed? Changed? Yes. It was only the ghost of Mercy Porter that I saw. I should not have known her but for her eyes. She had fine eyes, do you remember, and with a great deal of expression in them. I think I should be safe in swearing to Mercy Porter's eyes. Did she look poor or ill? She looked both, but the illness might be only hunger. She had that wan, pinched look one sees in the faces of the London poor, especially in the women's faces. Have you told her mother? No, I came to the conclusion that it would be giving the poor soul useless pain to tell her anything having so little to tell. She knew years ago that Colonel Tremaine had deserted his victim and that the girl had dropped through. God knows where. Into the abyss that swallows up handsome young women who begin their career in West End lodgings and a hired brougham. If the mother were to go in quest of her and bring her home here, it might be only to bring shame and misery upon her declining years. The creature may have fallen too low for the possibility of reformation, and the mother's last hours might be darkened by her sin. I would do much to rescue her, but I would rather try to save her through a stranger's help than by the mother's intervention. Lord Cheriton continued his pacing to and fro, and did not appear particularly interested in the case of Mercy Porter. He had been much troubled by her flight from Cheriton, for the seducer was his own familiar friend, and he had felt himself in some wise to blame for having brought such a man to Cheriton. He told himself that he would not have had to remain inside his house had his own daughter been out of the schoolroom, and yet he had allowed the man to cross the path of the widow's only child, and to bring desolation and sorrow upon the woman whose life he had in some wise taken under his protection. "'There are people whose mission it is to hunt out that kind of misery,' he said after an interval of silence. I hope one of those good women will rescue Mercy Porter. I think you have been wise in saying nothing to the mother. She has got over her trouble, and anything she might hear about the girl would be a reopening of old wounds. She is a wonderful woman, replied the vicar. I never saw such grief as hers when the girl ran away, and yet within a few months she had calmed down into the placid personage she has been ever since. She is a woman of very powerful mind. I sometimes wonder that even at her age she can content herself with the monotonous life she leads in that cottage. Oh, she likes the place, I believe, and the life suits her, said Lord Cheriton carelessly. She had seen a good deal of trouble before she came here, and this was a quiet haven for her after the storms of life. I am very sorry the daughter went wrong, he added, with a sudden cloud upon his face. That was a bitter blow and I shall never forgive myself for having brought that scoundrel Tremaine here. He is dead, is he not? Yes, he was killed in Afghanistan six years ago. He was a good soldier, though he was a bad man. I dare say he made his being ordered off to India an excuse for leaving Mercy, left her with a trifle of money, perhaps, and a promise of further remittances, and then let her drift. I told my lawyer to keep his eye upon her, if possible, and to establish her in some respectable calling if ever he saw the chance of doing so, but she eluded him somehow, as you know. Yes, you told me what you had done. It was like you to think even of so remote a claim upon your generosity. Oh, she belonged to Cheriton, 
I have cultivated the patriarchal feeling as much as I can. All who live upon my land are under my protection. Lady Cheriton has been a good friend to Mrs. Porter, too. My wife is always kind. Juanita accepted her cousin's account of what he had heard and read at St. Helier's as the closing of his researches in the history of the Strangways. The sister's death in a shabby exile remained to be traced, but there was no light to be expected there, and Juanita felt that she must now submit to surrender her superstition about that evil race. It was not from them the blow had come. The murderer had to be hunted for in a wider range, and the quest would be more difficult than she had thought. She was not the less intent upon discovery because of this difficulty. I have all my life before me, she told herself, and I have nothing to live for but to see his murderer punished. It had been Juanita's especial desire that the Morningsides and the Grenvilles should be invited to the Priory just as they had been in Sir Godfrey's lifetime that all the habits of the household should be as he had willed them when his bodily presence was there among them, as he was now in the spirit to Juanita's imagination. She thought of him every hour of the day, and in all things deferred to his opinions and ideas, shaping the whole course of her life to please him who was lying in that dark resting place where there is neither pain nor pleasure. When November came, however, and with it the troop of Grenvilles, nurses and nursery governess, and the morning sides with valet and maid, it seemed to Juanita as if the wild companions of Comus or a contingent from Bedlam had invaded the sober old priory. Those loud voices in the hall, that perpetual running up and down and talking and laughing upon the staircase, the everlasting opening and shutting of doors, the roll of carriage wheels driving up to the door a dozen times in a day, the bustle and fuss and commotion which two cheerful families in rude health can contrive to make in a house where they feel themselves perfectly at home, all these things were agonizing to the mourner who had lived in silence and shadow from the hour of her loss until now. Happily, however, Lady Jane was there to take all the burden off those weary shoulders, and Lady Jane, in the character of a grandmother, was in her very fittest sphere. Between her ladyship and the housekeeper all arrangements were made, and every detail was attended to without inflicting the slightest trouble upon Juanita. "'You shall see just as little of them all as you like, dear,' said Lady Jane. "'You can breakfast and lunch in your morning room, and just come down to dinner when you feel equal to being with us, and then you will see the darlings at dessert. I know they will cheer you with their pretty little ways. Such loving pets as they are, too, and so full of intelligence.' Did I tell you what Johnny said yesterday at lunch? Yes, dear Lady Jane, you did tell me. It was very funny, replied Juanita with a faint smile. She could not tell that adoring grandmother that the children were a burden to her, and that those intelligent speeches and delightful mispronunciations of polysyllabic words which convulsed parents and grandparent seemed to add perceptibly to her own gloom. She pretended to be interested in Tom's letter from Eton with a modest request for a large hamper, and she made a martyr of herself by showing Susie picture books and explaining the pictures or by telling Lucy her favorite Hans Andersen story, which never palled upon that young listener. "'Don't you think you would like a new one?' Juanita would ask. "'No, no, not a new one. The same, please. I want the proud darning needle.' So the adventures of the proud darning needle had to be read or related as the case might be. Juanita took Lady Jane's advice and spent the greater part of every day in her morning room, that room which had been Godfrey's den. It was further from the staircase than any other sitting room, and the clatter and the shrill voices were somewhat modified by distance. The house party amused themselves after their heart's desire, and worked the horses with the true metropolitan feeling that a horse is an animal designed for locomotion, and that he can't have too much of it. Lady Jane was the most indulgent of deputy hostesses, and spent all breakfast time in cutting sandwiches of a particularly dainty kind for her sons-in-law, so that they might be sustained between the luxurious home breakfast at nine, and the copious luncheon with which the cart met the shooters by appointment at half-past one. When the shooters had started, there were the little Grenvilles to slave for, and Lady Jane spent another half-hour in seeing them off upon their morning constitutional, Lucy on her Shetland, and Johnny, Susie, and Godolphin on their short little legs with groom and nurses in attendance. There were so many wraps to be adjusted, so many injunctions to be given to nurses and groom, so many little pockets to be filled with gingerbreads and queen cakes, while Mrs. Grenville looked on and protested against Grandmama's infraction of hygienic rules. Dr. Dobson Drews had said they must never eat between meals. 
Juanita rarely appeared before afternoon tea when she was generally installed in her own particular easy chair by the fire, fenced round by a seven-leaved Indian screen, which was big enough to include a couple of small tables and a creepy stool before the sisters-in-law came in from their afternoon drive or the shooters dropped in after their day in the woods. There were no other guests than the sisters and their husbands and it was an understood thing that no one else should be asked, unless it were Lord and Lady Cheriton, the Dalbrooks from Dorchester, or Mr. Scarsdale. No one could have been sweeter than the young widow was to her visitors during the hours she spent with them, listening with inexhaustible patience to Jessica Grenville's graphic account of the measles as lately taken by her whole brood, with all the after-consequences of the malady, and the amount of cod liver oil and quinine consumed by each patient pretending to be interested in Ruth Morningside's perpetual disquisitions upon smart people and smart people's frocks, and in every way performing her duty as a hostess. And yet George Grenville was not altogether satisfied. "'I'll tell you what it is, Jess,' he said to his wife one night, in the luxurious privacy of the good old-fashioned bedroom, seated on the capacious sofa in front of the monumental four-poster, with elaborately turned columns, richly molded cornice, and heavy damask curtains, the kind of bedstead for which our ancestors gave fifty guineas, and for which no modern auctioneer can obtain a bit of fifty shillings. "'I'll tell you what it is, Jess,' repeated Mr. Grenville, frowning at the fire. "'Either your brother's widow gives herself confounded airs, or there is something in the wind.' "'I'm afraid so, George,' replied his wife meekly. "'You're afraid of what? Why the deuce can't you be coherent? Afraid of her airs?' "'I'm afraid there is something in the wind,' faltered the submissive lady." I suppose it's the best thing that could happen to her poor girl, for a nursery will be an occupation for her mind and prevent her brooding on her loss, but this place would have been very nice for Tom all the same. I should think it would indeed, and he ought not be swindled out of it, said Mr. Grenville with a disgusted air. I, I am surprised at your sister-in-law. I have always considered that there is a kind of indelicacy in a posthumous child. It may be a prejudice on my part, but I have always felt a sort of revulsion when I have heard of such creatures. And Mr. Grenville curled his lordly aquiline nose and made a wry face at the jovial fire blazing hospitably, heaped high with coals and wood and roaring up towards the frosty sky. End of chapter 13